So our next presenter is Bob Markman. He is with USDA Animal Care and he is an inspector in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Bob. Well, welcome everybody. I know this is a long journey and it was for me yesterday getting here. So I'm sure you may have had flight delays or travel problems. So I'm here to talk about the Animal Welfare Act, how to get registered with USDA. We're gonna talk about the regulations and standards during transport. <clears throat> So if you went online to our website, uh, you can get the blue book. It has different shades of blue, but the public version would look something like this if you got a hard copy. Um, the blue book is actually part of the Code of Federal Regulations. So Title IX of the Code of Federal Regulations is where these, uh, this blue book comes from. The Animal Care a few years ago was asked to put the act in. We had a lot of people questioning where we get our authority from. So the first part of the blue book has the act. So <clears throat> mine has tabs. It's a little bit easier for me to go through that. So we're gonna talk about the four sections of the blue book. If you got a copy of the Title IX CFR, it would have from one to like almost 200 parts. Uh, we're fortunate in animal, animal welfare. The first three, three or four sections are right in the front of the CFR. So about once a year, the CFR gets reprinted. We don't always reprint our book to get a hard copy because some years we don't make any changes, but this was a big year for changes with the bird rule that came out last February. And for licensees, it went into effect this week. So that's a major change. So the blue book is being updated. Right now it's available online. So if you have the 2002 version, it would not have birds in. So you'd have to either copy the CFR um, or I took the federal register. It's a little bit easier because it's in three columns. You don't waste as much paper. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So if you have the blue book, I don't think anybody has it in front of them, but if you had the blue book, there's four sections that we, we regulate. Uh, the first one is definitions. And that's part one. And then part two would be regulations. And then three would be standards, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes. And then four would be um, rules of practice governing certain besieging, procedures. So talking about the regulations and standards, part two and three, we have a program aid that helps you determine if you need a, a license or need to be registered. So there's a bunch of animal activities and we don't regulate everything. The Animal Welfare Act is pretty specific, but uh, this program aid 1117 is the number. It just was updated in February. So on our website, if you went into animal welfare, um, our website, and there's different ways of getting there. That's our website at the bottom. Um, you could also Google uh, aphis.usda.gov. That will bring up aphis first. You'll see animal health right below that is animal welfare. So you click on animal welfare, that will bring up our website. If you follow the left-hand side down, you'll see publications, forms, and guidance documents. And that's where most of our aids, the blue book will be found. The program aid that I just mentioned, um, that could be found there. Um, I think that's about the third thing down on the top. The blue book is gonna be up in the top once you go to publications, forms, and guidance documents. So that would have the, the blue book would be the, the most updated version until they print it out. Um, that's, that would have the birds in it. So that's a handy reference. So if you want to apply for a license, there's several ways you could do it. You can go online. We have a licensing, licensing tool that helps to um, determine if you need a license or not. You can use the program aid to see if you need to be licensed or registered. You can call the office in Fort Collins. That's where all the registrations and licenses are issued from. Uh, you, again, there's our website. So you can go directly to um, our website. You could also email animalcare.usda.gov. The Fort Collins office is normally manned um, 
between 7.30 and like five, um, there's a little bit a difference with the time zone. So if you're from the east, don't call the first thing and they may not be there yet, but usually about seven o'clock, um, cause I'm in the east. I can usually get someone about 7.30 their time. Now, if you're in a business of transporting animals, you're probably gonna be registered as a carrier or an intermediate handler. So our T registrations are for carriers. So if you're an airline, a trucking company, and you're moving animals from point A to B or A, B, and C, you're probably gonna have a T certificate. The H's could also transport animals, but they may have a holding facility. So for instance, an air, airport, if it's a major port of entry right now, they'll probably have a bonded facility that will be handling the animals when they arrive. They could also, a lot of airlines have contracted some of those services. So if you go to the front, front desk of a cargo counter, you'll probably be dealing with an H. They may not have, you might be flying American or Delta, but they may not have that uniform on. The uniform is, the, is probably the intermediate handler's uniform. So they'll do a lot of um, accepting the animals, making sure it gets on the aircraft. Uh, they'll make sure um, once they accept it, they wanna make sure they have all the documentation before you leave. Also a lot of intermediate handlers, the way I look at it is you're going from A to B, but you may, or A to C, but you may stop. So a lot of times a boarding facility, I used to have several registered, uh, they would pick up animals at the airport, hold them. Sometimes people were moving, they would hold that animal. Um, for instance, if someone was moving from Pennsylvania right now to, to Dallas, and it was too hot to fly their animal, uh, they might move. And then a few weeks later, or a few months, they might have the, um, the kennel um, make sure that makes the shipment. And so they'll pay a, usually a, a fee up front um, and give an estimate of how long this animal will be, in, be held for them. So this is one area that we do not regulate, and that would be animals being um, able to fit underneath the seat. So if animals that travel on a commercial carrier, but remain in the possession of the owner or a representative are not covered under the Animal Welfare Act. So if they're checked as baggage or if they're checked as cargo, they are regulated. But if they can walk on, and a lot of airlines have made some restrictions on this with companion animals. They were getting all kinds of animals coming on, but it has to be able to fit underneath the seat. <laughs> So turning to the, the blue book again, we're gonna talk about section two. And there's some important regulations in section two uh, that have to do with T's and H's. So the first one would be that they need to register if they're shipping animals. So it's pretty common that someone will ship animals and need, don't understand that they need to be registered. The airlines are gonna, um, want to deal with registered carriers if they're going to be dropping off animals on a regular basis. So they're going to want to make sure you're registered with USDA. Oftentimes breeders are not registered with us as T's and H's, but they are as a, maybe a class A. So luckily they've done this before um, and they're used to bringing animals to the airport and they know about the crates and the sizes and, and um, the water bowls. And the other one would be record keeping. Um, so they must keep copies of the health certificate if it's dogs, cats, or non-human primates. They must keep copy of the health certificate and at least for one year. And that would include other records like the air well way bill, um, usually um, documents that accompany the shipment. And they must keep those records for at least one year. Another important regulation is a section 2.131 on, on handling, section E. This was added in, I think 2004, it was, a, it was an amendment that was added to the regulations. We also, when we talk about parts three in a few minutes, and I mentioned um, the subparts with going from dogs and cats all the way up to birds, 
they also have a handling, but that has to do more with um, the holding area that the animals are going to be housed in. So this handling is very specific about making sure that there's, um, when we have these kind of climate conditions like right now in, in Texas and California and Arizona, where we have these really high temperatures, most airlines are gonna put an embargo on, say we're not gonna be shipping. So just be mindful if you're trucking. Um, the previous speaker mentioned about how they try to truck at night when it's cooler. Well, right now in Dallas, it's still 85 at night. So if you have a brachiocephalic breed, probably very few airlines are gonna be wanting to ship that animal, even in the evening. And I know this is gonna be talked about later, but this contingency planning is required for T's and H's too. So the plan has several things it must address. We do have a form on file. Um, it's an optional form. The number is 7,093. And it can be used to complete your contingency plan. It has important contact numbers and it has an outline that you can follow. But the plan has to address certain situations what specific tasks um, should the plan address? So that could be very unique for an airline or a carrier. So I would probably consider escapes, uh, weather delays. I would also consider if animals have to be boarded for any length of time. So at least some of those things should be in your plan. But what specific tasks, who will be fulfilling those tasks, how responsible recovery will be handed, should be part of that plan and making sure you go over it with your employees. So at least once a year, you should be going over with your employees. If you have new help that was hired, that's pretty common right now with the airlines. Um, I've known some people for 30 something years and then there are some people are, are always seem to be new at the counter or in the cargo building. This is also an important change to the regulations in 2008. This was part of the farm bill. Um, 2023 is also about every five years, every five years, the uh, farm bill comes up for reauthorization. And so this is a, another big year for farm bill. So sometimes with the act, it could be Congress that changed um, and the various presidents over the years that have signed the, uh, made changes to the act, but the farm bill um, could also put regulations in. So in this case, um, the farm bill in 2008, um, made these changes. And it took us about, I think 2013 when these regulations actually came out. There was a lot of discussion with FAA and CDC um, before this came out. So the following requirements must be met. The animal has to be in good health. It has to be vaccinated for rabies in its temper, hepatitis, leptospirosis, parvovirus, and parainfluenza. The dog must be at least six months of age. Dog is accompanied by an import permit issued by APHIS. Those permits are issued at least 30 days prior to travel. And a dog is accompanied by a health certificate and rabies vaccination certificate. Specifically, if you were looking in the blue book, what I just read in the previous slide. So these are the four sections you have to meet. So those are the sections of the blue book. If you turn to 2.150, it talks about the permit. 2.151 talks about the certification for health certificates and vaccination records. 2.152 talks about notification of arrival. Now, the point of arrival might be different than the port of entry. So we have five ports, soon we'll have six, that can accept some of these animals from the, some of these dogs from high risk rabies countries. So those five countries, or excuse me, five um, ports of entry uh, will have a bonded facility either at the airport, at the case of JFK that has the ARC, or they'll have a bonded facility uh, very close by. So when those arrive, they may not end up, they may end up at the port of entry, but they might touch down at another airport in the United States coming from the foreign airlines. So if, for instance, some animals leaving Asia, might arrive at Seattle or Portland or Anchorage before moving to the East Coast to either JFK, Dulles, Miami, or Atlanta. On the West Coast, the other one is LAX. 
Um, in the next few weeks, I understand that Philadelphia will be the sixth port of entry. And also, when they come notified of arrival, if they come to an airport that is not the port of entry, that port of arrival, all those documents have to be there. Um, usually it's one of the 18 CDC recognized port of arrivals. So if they come and they don't have this document, they can be turned around. They can be put on the next plane back. They can be refused entry. So make sure those documents are with that, that shipment. And then dogs that are refused entry, that's in 2.153. So now we're going to turn to part three. And if you have the tabs like I have, we're talking about that much of the book. But we're going to be more specific and just talk about the, the back part of the, each subchapter, and that will be um, the transportation standards. So for dogs and cats, talking about the transportation standards. This outline is pretty much followed for all the subgroups from A to G. And some of them are pretty similar. So the dog subpart A is very similar to the non-human primates. It's also very similar to the birds. So part, the reason I'm going over these regulations is because later on I'll be showing you some slides of non-compliances. And I find the biggest problem we're facing right now with USDA is a lot of airlines and uh, truckers do not know the regulations. And I don't know if they haven't received them because they're online, they haven't read them, they haven't been trained in them. So this is kind of redundant for some people, um, but it's very important that you know these regulations. If you're used to handling dogs and cats and then rabbits show up, take out that CFR, look it up. Make sure you understand those regulations. When we show up at an airport, we don't have, a, we don't give a correction date. So it's either right or wrong. It's either, it's either in compliance or it's not. So we're obligated to document all that. And I get paid the same if it's no non-compliances or a hundred. <laughs> I hope I don't have a hundred. Um, but it's kind of time consuming writing this every time. And again, we can, we can train that carrier intermediate handler over there next month or a next shift, it could be a different person. So I'm putting this emphasis in talking about subpart A because we're gonna constantly be writing up stuff if people don't understand these transport standards. Hmm. So the basic outline of the transportation starting for dogs and cats would be accepting um, dogs and cats for transport. And so they should have a food and water certificate attached. And if it's gonna be, if they're gonna be shipping under 45, Degrees, if the holding area goes below that, they need an acclimation certificate. Under 3.15, they should have labels and markings. And whether it's a dog and cat, and whether it's in subpart A or a bird in subpart G, this is very standard. They either need the words live animals, and when we talk about non human primates and marine mammals and some of the animals in subpart uh, F, they're going to need the words wild animals if it's more appropriate. So live animals, there's a very specific regulation that says they have to be one inch high. I see everything on those IATA labels. They have the little word animal, live animal on it. They can be a quarter inch, they can be two inches, they can be three inches. I don't care if they're bigger, we need them one inch. They need to be on top and at least on one side. They also should have hours or markings to, to show the correct upright position. If they don't have that, something's wrong because we've had crates upside down and I'll show you that later. We really don't want to see that. Um, most of the time it's a doll container, so it's pretty obvious. Um, so when you get into some of the um, exotic animals, it may not be so obvious. <laughs> Even for some of the guinea pigs, and I'll show you those in a second. Also, ventilation rims, projecting rims. Very specific for all these groups, they have to be three quarters of an inch. Now, sometimes you'll see an enclosure that's kind of like shaped like that. So it may not need a protecting rim because the airspace might be here. And so it has enough. So if you put a, a yardstick or a straight line 
where the container is. If you have an inch of airspace, that's fine. But most containers tend to be flat or rectangular, and they need a projecting rim. They either need a larger lid, or they need a rim around the middle of that enclosure, or they need some handholds that will keep the, the airspace from getting blocked. Mm -hmm. And also the animals need to meet certain space requirements. Under 3.17, and I'm just highlighting this, I encourage people to really understand these regulations because these are very common things we write up. Um, under food and water receptacles, under, under 3.17, for dogs and cats, they need two. They could have one that has a divider, but they need two. They may be able to drink and they may need to eat. And they have to be tasked on the inside. I see a lot of water bottles on the outside. That's fine, but we need them on the inside. They need to be able to be filled from outside. Mm -hmm. And they have to be attached securely. And again, there are some handling uh, requirements for um, the holding facility with temperatures. It's usually 85 and 45, that the animal cannot be subject to anything above 85 without additional ventilation. And again, if the holding area is going to be below 45, you need that help, that um, acclimation certificate. Guinea pigs and hamsters follow that same kind of general outline. Um, they still need that label. The label uh, on top of the enclosure must say the number and type and number of guinea pigs or hamsters in the enclosure. Under 3.36, the primary enclosure for guinea pigs and hamsters have very specific weight, height, minimum space requirements, and maximum number of animals per enclosure. For guinea pigs, the maximum number of animals is 15, and for hamsters, it's 50. Under 3.38, food and water receptacles, if, animals are going to, if these animals are going to be transported for more than six hours, they must have access to food and water on the type of, of food and water, which provides the quantity and quality to satisfy the food and water needs. Oftentimes I see these animals, uh, guinea pigs and hamsters shipped with carrots. Sometimes the carrots are soaked. Um, hopefully they're not too much more than a day getting to their destination. Rabbits follow the same general outline as the other two sections. Under 3.60, they must have a label that shows the number of rabbits in the enclosure. And very similar to guinea pigs, a maximum of 15. Now, I've never seen 15 rabbits in one enclosure. I've seen four or five little bunnies, but it says they could have 15. Usually, if they're adult rabbits, we'll, we'll see dividers. They'll just be singly housed. I think the most I've ever seen rabbits in the same enclosure being transported, I think, was four. Again, if rabbits are going to be transported for more than six hours, they must have access to food and water or a type of food which provides the quantity and quality of the, to, to satisfy the food and water needs. Again, oftentimes I've seen rabbits with hay, carrots. I've seen some gel packs, sometimes water um, devices in there for them. As I said earlier about the dogs and cats, non-human primates have very similar section. So this outline is pretty similar to what we have with the dogs and cats. They must have a food and water instructions, must, be, must include the time and date the animals were last fed and watered, and very specific instructions for the next feeding and watering for up to 24 hour period. Under labels, the labels must have the words one inch, as I mentioned earlier, in height, with the words wild animals or live animals on top and on at least one or more sides with arrows or markings to identify the upright position. So this is kind of redundant. Enclosures must provide enough space for the non-human primate to turn about freely, to sit upright, and the head cannot touch the top. Certain larger non-human primates like your gorillas or chimpanzees may have some restricted movements in accordance with professionally accepted standards in care to safely transport these animals. Water must also be provided every 12 hours and, for, and food every 12 hours for non-human primates under one year. 
and every 24 hours for non-human primates that are older than one year. So food every 12 hours if they're under one year and 24 for anything that's over one year. And again, these have to be, oftentimes I've seen tubes that they can load the things from the top. They have a top that removes slightly and they can add the food right through the tubes into the dishes. And they have to be secured correctly in the corners. <laughs> Marine mammals have very specifics. Um, they need a very specific certificate stating that the transport enclosures meet the USDA standards for shipping. They also must have an acclimation certificate that must be completed by the attending veterinarian within 10 days of shipping the marine mammal. Enclosures must also contain the words live animals or wild animals specific to the enclosure requirements so, excuse me, specific primary enclosure requirements must be met. Water must be provided for marine mammals that require drinking water within four hours prior to transport. And food must be offered, offered as often as necessary that is appropriate for the species being transported as determined by the attending veterinarian. Specific requirements to keep the animal cool and or warm to prevent overheating, hypothermia, or temperature related stress in addition to meeting other care and transit standards. Subpart F, <laughs> this is probably our most general section. So it covers anywhere from a gerbil to an elephant. So the first three, four sections, when the act was first established in 1966, it was called the Laboratory Animal Welfare Act. It didn't actually get the name Animal Welfare Act until the 1970s. So in the beginning, when it was a laboratory Animal Welfare Act, the USDA wrote very specific standards for dogs, cats, guinea pigs, rabbits, and non-human primates. By the time we got the sub, by the time exotic animals and wild animals were put under us in 1970, um, we had this real general section. So this is probably the most general section of all, but it follows that same outline. Uh, some enclosures probably would be better off marking them wild animals. So if you're, hopefully no one reaches their finger in, but if it's something that's likely to take your finger off, make sure you put the words wild animals because we have some curious people at the airports. <laughs> and occasionally we, we see people like, what's in there? Um, so make sure they, if they do provide with food and water that you're filling them from the outside. Um, I've seen gerbils usually just have the words live animals, but if it's a lion or a tiger or a coyote or a cougar that's being transported from a zoo, make sure you put the words wild animals. <laughs> so all animals must be offered potable water within four hours prior to being transported, must provide water every 12 hours once transported is initiated. Animals must be fed at least once every 24 hour period, except as directed for hibernation, veterinary treatment, normal fast and other professionally accepted practices. A sufficient quantity of food and water must accompany shipment for at least 24 hours. Some point, as Mark, Dr. Keller mentioned earlier, our regulations, a lot of our transport regulations were written in 76. A lot of them came out between 77 and 79. We didn't have these long distance uh, foreign airlines shipping animals. Some of those are, some of those are almost going, taking two days to get here. So at some point we have this 24 hour rule. I imagine it will be amended at some point to include some of these longer transports because they really should have food that lasts more than 24 hours. And then we get to birds. So this is our big week for birds. So Monday we started regulating birds at licensed facilities and I got my first complaint already. So um, we'll see how many more come in because I guess the public knows we're gonna be inspecting birds. So for other licensee, for other people that have birds that aren't regulated um, just yet because they're not licensed, they have until February. So we're gonna start inspecting these at transport. So I've been seeing birds at airports for years. <laughs> so this will be new for me. Um, so with birds, they have very specific regulations. So these are the newest sections. They just were published in February of 23. So 
as I mentioned earlier, if you have a 22 book, it's, it's available online, Part G won't be in there. So unless you download the um, Federal Register or download Part C or Part G, uh, which will take a lot of pages. Um, but anyway, we're just gonna talk about the transportation standards. So I have to watch my time here. Yeah, so the first section would be 3.1. 61 if delays cause the bird shipment to arrive more than 12 hours later than originally scheduled the carrier intermediate handler must contact the consigner and or consignee to notify them of the delay on wing birds cannot be transported unless an attending veterinarian states it is necessary for veterinary care and instructions are specified in writing by the attending vet within 10 days of shipping 3.162 all materials are or treatment used on transport enclosures must be non-toxic. So we don't wanna see a lot of galvanized wire that ha that's been coated, that has zinc running down the sides. Um, 3.164, all warm, all green birds must be offered water within four hours of being transported. Green birds must be offered water every 12 hours and fed at least once every 24 hour period written instructions for the in-transit food and water requirements must be attached to the outside of the enclosure. Very similar to what the non-human primates and dog section has. 3.68, about the climatic and environmental conditions during transport. Those birds that are not able to maintain a constant body temperature at ambient temperature must be transported in a brooder or other temperature related regulating unit. The temperature of the brooder or, reg or the temperature regulating unit must be monitored during transportation and appropriate for the live birds. Written instructions must be attached to the outside of the enclosure for the temperature requirements for birds, transport in brooders or temperature regulated units. So that's all we're gonna talk about for the B part. Um, two and three until we start showing examples. So here's some of you may possibly encounter at an airport. The photo on the left is actually rabbits. And I can, how many can notice some problems right there? Anybody see a projecting rim? And the photo on the right, I believe that had a mixture of small animals. I think there were rats, mice, and guinea pigs in some of those different containers. So remember we said some of the animals need to have food and water certificates. So it's really nice when the, the label on top also have the words live animals. So you got the live animal label plus the food and water. So we don't want animals being dropped off, say the flights at noon. We don't want animals being dropped off at eight o'clock and the people actually held, withheld the food and water from them since the night before. So they have, when they deliver the animal, they need to say when they last fed and watered. The airline should not be accepted if it's been more than four hours. Now, a lot of airlines, domestic airlines in the last couple of years don't even want animals showing up four hours in advance. If the flight's not to noon, they, a lot of them are saying come back to, at 10 o'clock or come back two hours before. We do occasionally used to see carriers that they had permission to bring them six hours in advance. I, I, I know that... What I've been hear, hearing and seeing for years is almost nobody wants animals coming six hours before flight time, especially with all the delays that we, we have sometimes with this weather. So here's a couple of examples where they have the live animal labels on the left, um, and they also have the arrows. So the live animal labels look fine. They look at least one inch. And then at least on one side, they have the, so the photo on the right shows some upright arrows. It's great if they have them on all four sides, but we require at least on one. So inside the crate, I can hardly read that. Um, animal must be able to come, so this is for dogs. Animal must be able to comfortably sit, stand and turn around. And also they must have food and water receptacles that are secured inside. And I'll show you some examples where they weren't secured inside. 
and they must have some type of absorbable bedding. So for now for these um, international flights, that is a big problem, that absorbable bedding. And they have to be uh, safe construction, no sharp points or edges or protruding objects. So here's a non-compliance where they didn't put the, when the, last, the animals were last offered food and water and they didn't put the 24 hour food and water requirements in. This is actually pretty common. Um, I wish it wasn't common. I prefer to see that label on top, but it's okay as long as it's not blocking some of the airspace. Um, that I don't like when it's part, some of that's airspace. <laughs> so that shouldn't really be down over any of those folds. <laughs> um, a few years ago, we were seeing, they were trying to keep the crates warm. They would put ceram wrap around those air holes. Not a good idea. <laughs> Here's an international flight that had the words, they have mostly symbols and these can come in different colors, but you can see the words live animals. It might be a little hard to see where you are, but it was only a quarter of an inch high. So I'm glad they had the symbols because a lot of people are notice symbols but I like to see that live animals. It has to be at least one inch on top and at least on one side. That was the only label. And it wasn't just like that. It was that for 54 crates. So that's an easy one to write up. You take one picture and just say it was 50 times over. Here's an example of guinea pigs being loaded. Now this airline, I've inspected this airline for years. They're very familiar with dogs and cats when they get to this. When they ship guinea pigs or rabbits, they make a lot of mistakes. So here, no labels. These were guinea pigs. They didn't say on top how many guinea pigs were in the container. Um, they do have a way of adding water right there. There's a hole they can, they have a receptacle in, that, in each corner, but there's no instructions. There's no labels. Someone just woke up along here they forgot to put the food and water dish in. They forgot to put bedding. So that airline should never have accepted this. This is 2023, we should not be seeing things like this. This is 23, All, most of these photos are from 23. So here you have a detached food and water receptacle. Um, these were back in this year, earlier this year, they were wiring them in. Dogs are just breaking them off. Um, and here's one with only has one receptacle. Now we're counting that as water because the liquid from that water bottle is supposed to, hopefully it, it, it drains into that container. Sometimes that's in between, sometimes I've seen these water bottles in between the two containers. So if the dog breaks off that spout, that whole container is gonna get wet. This is, a, this is one of those long flights came in this way. Now I didn't show you the worst. This was the average. <laughs> so the one on the left, they had this rag, that was their only bedding. You can see the one bowl that was pulled off way back in there. And then this one, this is where they were wiring it. Now, this was about a month later, they did put a bath mat in. Now I would recommend that they put a wee wee pad or a pee pee pad, whatever you want to call them underneath that bath mat, and then put a bunch of shredded paper on top. So that white stuff is actually the cargo netting. A lot of these international flights, they don't want these animals getting loose in transit. So the whole, the whole set of containers are all wrapped in this um, cargo netting. And then the doors are all secured with four plastic ties, two, two on top, two on bottom. They really don't want these animals getting loose. <laughs> and like I mentioned, they, they could be in there anywhere from 16 to 24 hours. <laughs> Again, here's some bad examples, or you may say the good examples of the bad thing. Um, that rag is doing almost nothing. It's probably the only thing that was clean in there. <laughs> that whole container is wet. It's probably not the best photo. And this one had more feces and and absorbable bedding. Again, the, the rag is doing, the rag is clean. It's sitting right there. We've been inspecting foreign airlines for about 20 years. You should not be seeing this. Huh. 
here's the dog that's been in there. Now, if you know anything about bulldogs or golden retrievers, if you put any kibble in that quart size container, it's going to find a way to break that, that container to get those kibbles at the bottom of that thing. I don't know why they're using quart size containers. A pint would be fine for food. I'd rather it be metal because you're paying a lot to get these dogs here. I don't know why they're still using these plastic containers. They're cheap, that's why. But we're still writing these up almost every time. And here, when they were using the wire, remember I mentioned earlier, you could see that right there protruding right above where the animal is gonna be fed or watered. So they're not using wire anymore, luckily. <laughs> At least this shipper isn't. <laughs> Oop, hit the wrong one. <laughs> Again, this is 2023. I wish it was 76. Um, we should not be seeing this in 23. Why are these dogs spending so much money to get here? And they still are putting almost every shipment. There's always a couple yet. We're still writing up length and width, or excuse me, length and height. So when I was looking at this dog on the left, I could tell he, the way he was hunched in there. So I said, I'd like to see that dog. So they took it out and you could see, it's probably not the best because the dog was moving around. He's glad to be out of there. Um, that's a pretty long flight. So again, I have actual measurements. I'll measure him from the base of the tail to the tip of the nose. I'll measure his height. Here's a, again an enclosure. Uh, I don't want to assume what was in there. It could have been a nine human primate, could have been a rather exotic animal, but there's really no projecting rim. They have these ropes for handholds, but that's not protecting that airspace. When a plane's taking off, that cargo is moving, it's shifting. If there's a box or other cargo, it all slides, just like your luggage does. <laughs> You hear those overhead compartments, you need just a little bit of, if there's only a couple when you're flying, you hear those things shift. A lot of times these are shifting too. On landing, the same thing happens, it's shifting. That's why that cargo netting is helpful. But if they have other cargo nearby, that space is gonna get blocked. Again, nice fancy labels, nice and red and, Big is, but where's the rim? That rim was less than a quarter of an inch. So there's nothing to protect that airspace. <laughs> We're almost at the end here. Oh, I get done all right. Why is this happening in 23? <laughs> so I had a bad day. So this, this ship, shipment came into one of our ports of entry this year that way. And it's like, I'm, first, I'm, my first question is, why well, was put on a fork with that way? But then I would start asking some questions. Let me see if I get to this one. So we have to try to determine this sometimes at USDA. So who accepted this shipment? Who transported this enclosure? How did this enclosure get turned upside down? When did this happen? Was it shipped in this manner? Who handled this enclosure? Who was responsible for that? Was the animal harmed or injured during this transit? So that's the actual dog. So there's several citations you could write here because the labels now are upside down. The arrows would be upside down. You could see the eye, you could see the label right there. All the animals are upside down. The food and water dishes are upside down. The water bottle's upside down. The bedding's, at least the bedding came down. Now this could have been easily sobbed when it was picked up, but it could also have been sobbed before it was delivered because it, it was delivered this way. <laughs> so the guy at the, the agent, and I don't want to make, name the country, he knew it was wrong. He didn't tell a supervisor because he didn't know how to fix it. He could have slowly turned it and we could have fixed this whole thing. So this animal arrived at a port of entry this year, uh, upside down. Not the dog, he was smart enough to turn around. <laughs> so how would you, if this was a long flight, how would you feed and water this animal? Huh. You couldn't. <laughs> you 
You know, I often tell my facilities that I've never wrote up a facility in 37 years that was too clean. I almost wrote this up for having too much bedding. And I thought that was amazing because usually they don't have enough bedding. <laughs> so I was at the counter last, a cargo counter last, last year. And these people came to pick up their dog. And so the airline person had them sign some, the airline agent had them sign some paperwork. And, I, and she put this container on a contain, on the counter and it's like, they came all this way to pick up an empty container. And she goes, no, there's a dog in there. And so she pulled it out. So this dog was tired of all the noise, all the aggravation, it just pushed up all its bedding. So I actually thought that was a good thing, but I wouldn't want it. It was the first time I think in 37 years I've seen too much bedding. So I'll leave you with that. Too much is sometimes better than not enough. <laughs> So if anybody have any questions, I can I'm gonna go a little fast on that. Yes. <laughs> All right, if you are in session, please raise your hand and wait for a mic. If you are virtually, please put it in the Q&A and Karen will ask the question for you. Hi, I'm Beth Schutte from the ARC. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, with regard to the uh, non-compliant imports, <clears throat> does the shipper bear any responsibility at All. Oh not the airline. No, oh, excuse me. I, I'm talking the shipper is the airline. No, okay, I'm saying the actual shipper as opposed to the consignor mm. as opposed to the airline. So a lot of times um, the shipper is not regulated by us. <laughs> right. A lot of these are coming in for rescues. So they're not regulated by us um, because they're adopting and they're having a face-to-face -face transaction. So we do write up the airline for shipping them this way, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. And then, and then, <clears throat> as you mentioned, there was uh, sometimes where animals may have to be returned. Thankfully, with the new CDC regulations, those aren't happening as often now. Isn't there an inherent animal welfare conflict that an animal gets imported, they're non-compliant, and they may be sick or injured, and now facing a 12-hour ship back to the country of origination? And then also USDA has to face the health certificate issue that an animal can't be exported from the United States without an appropriate health certificate that the animal by definition can't, <laughs> can't uh, clear. So we say they're gonna be shipped back. That's why we want these bonded facilities, okay. okay? So they have to be able to hold these animals for 28 days if they're refused. If the rest of the shipment is fine, there was only one or two that were sick, they will hold that animal for 28 days. CDC has to release that animal. USDA doesn't release it, CDC right. does. Customs has to release that animal. USDA, um, we don't do every shipment, but we try to be at some of, the, some of these bigger shipments, yes. Right. Well, thankfully, uh, we see you a lot more at our uh, facility this year. Thank you. Karen, do you have any questions? I do. Um, question is, do you have guidance on acceptable temps for the acclimatization certificate? This is a gray area for many species, and I'm often unsure if they can handle temps outside the standard guidelines. I was trying to find out who was talking. Could you say it one more time, Karen? Sure. Do you have guidance on acceptable temps for the acclimation certificate? This is a gray area for many species, and I'm often unsure if they can handle temps outside the standard guidelines. To be honest with you, I haven't seen any acclimation certificates because almost no airline wants to accept it if it's under 45 if their temperature. So I haven't seen them in almost 30 years. Uh, we don't have a specific document for that. Uh, maybe Chad could work on it. <laughs> but uh, we are working on a, I understand we have the arrows and the labels. We're, we're gonna reprint some of those. A lot of those are available from companies online to order labels. Um, I know USDA, we talked about it this past year a lot uh, about having food and water certificates. So maybe we'll have to think about an acclimation certificate. We really don't like those. <laughs> so they're kind of rare anymore. Um, when I did see them, it was more for puppies trying to ship them in the worst conditions in the worst temperatures. So, most of them are being shipped by truck now, and they really don't want to use the airlines for shipping a lot of those puppies. <laughs> okay, next question. 
Hi, my name is Rochelle Rogers and I'm a zoological consultant. And I, I'm gonna take a little uh, latitude here. I have two questions. Um, one is about birds and one is about records. Um, with the feeding intervals being 12 hours and 24 hours, um, with hummingbirds, um, that could uh, impair their health because their um, metabolism is so high. And on the IATA requirements, they're actually required to have a light inside their shipping container so that they can feed while in transit. Is there any uh, thought of possibly changing that for birds to incorporate different uh, taxa of birds to have different feeding intervals? And quickly, uh, the requirement for records retention, you're saying it's one year, but now we have USDA licenses that are lasting three years. Is there going to be a change of that records retention policy? So we normally try to get to every facility within 12 months. So that's why we, we don't ask you to keep records for three years, because we usually just go back to the last time we were there to look at those records. Um, I don't know if that's a consideration because hopefully we're going to see all our facilities within a year. That, that's the reason it's there. I know there's some other agencies that have longer holding periods, but normally for what we need, we want it to be less than a year. <laughs> Most zoos, it's permanent. Yeah, okay. As far as your first question, I'm probably not qualified for that one. Um, so some of those animals that have really special needs, I would probably put that right on a certificate on top. <laughs> if you want to feed them 24 hours, that's better than not feeding them for 24 hours. So if they need food constantly, make sure that's in there and, and label it that way. <laughs> and if you guys have any specific questions to transporting birds, um, our avian specialist will be on the panel at 415. And so he will be more than happy to answer any of your avian transportation questions that you guys have at 415 as well. Karen, do we have a, one more question online? Let's see here. Um, are animal rescue groups transporting dogs and cats that they then resell in another state required to register as a transporter doing their own movements? That's a technical question. We are registering quite a few of them as T's right now. <laughs> If they think they're doing regulated activity, again, you can look at that program aid 117. Um, it has a lot of guidance. Um, you can contact Fort Collins, but some of those gray areas, it won't hurt you to get a registration. For one, it's free. Uh, you do have to update it about every three, every three years, but it's good to have because it's gonna point you in the right direction if you're doing that stuff that you think needs to be regulated. Okay, next question. Hi, my name's uh, Caroline Brewer and I'm here with Air Pets, who is an intermediate handler, but also on behalf of IPATA. Um, we have a lot, of, obviously we're an organization of pet shippers across the United States and all over the world. Um, oftentimes we, we are confronted with issues of the airlines not complying with USDA regulations. And we struggle with how, how do we get um, ground handlers who may not be trained as well as they need to be, how do we get them to understand some of the regulations that we need to abide by, um, such as the watering regulations. And, and there's a little bit of contradiction there because we're saying don't attach a water bottle on the outside because it'll get knocked off. But then how do you get the water in if you don't put a funnel or something else that may get knocked off? So we've been told um, don't attach funnels, attach funnels. Um, we've been told don't attach water bottles, attach water bottles. Um, and then the food, we've also been told not to put any food on a container that's not um, sealed and labeled by a manufacturer so that, so that, you know, we, the contents is known as to what it is. Um, and then when you talked about the six hour regulation, 
there were, there's been many, many complaints across the United States about airlines requesting animals be checked in as much as 12 hours in advance. So we struggle with how to say, okay, USDA requires this, here's the regulation, but getting the ground handler or the airline to comply. So is there anything that we can do um, as an organization to try to help with that? Well, sometimes if you deal with the headquarters of that organization, so whatever airline you're having the trouble with, um, reach out to them, ask for a station manager. Um, you know, sometimes you're on a shift too, but I would ask for, if you're having a lot of problems with a particular airport or a particular carrier, try to go a little bit higher. And, and we do that as an organization, IPADA does that, but in the moment you get animals rejected for certain reasons or they go without what their needs are without being compliant because the airline refuses something so i guess what i'm asking is there any way we can figure out some kind of in the moment hotline how do we get usda to support us we can't tell the airlines they have to ship animals because I know in the last year or two, you have very few domestic airlines now shipping. And they just decided it's, it's not worth the hassle. It's not worth with paying USDA fines. It's not worth the public. So you're seeing a lot more being shipped um, by vehicle or truck. So it is a tough question. If, if you know that your container meets the requirements, you can put that on top. This meets USDA requirements. Some containers already are putting that on. Um, as far as water bowls, our requirements is they do have to be on the inside. Yes, if they want to attach a water bottle, what I'm seeing on some of these foreign flights, though, some of the bulldogs are pulling that lixic off. They're pulling that um, the metal part off and the hardware sitting in the dish. <laughs> so if that's the way they want to form, um, a watering can works pretty well with a long spout. Um, I've seen people with the dry kibble they just get a little shoot and they run the kibble right into the bowl. So you, you really don't want them to have to open up that enclosure. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bob Markman. We appreciate your topic today.